Okay, uh, welcome again, uh, those of you that are joining us for, uh, for joining me rather, for uh, Criminal Procedure, 10th edition, Joel Shamara, uh, published by Cengage Learning. This is for Court Procedure and Evidence, uh, Wake Tech. These lectures are being recorded uh, in the spring, starting in January, but the spring of 2023, and we're working our way through our text here. And uh, this is specifically designed for the uh, class that we teach here at Wake Tech for Procedure and Evidence. But of course, anyone is welcome. These lectures will be published on uh, YouTube, so everybody's welcome. And we're going to pick up now with Chapter 8, which is self incrimination. And it starts with a quote, uh, interestingly enough, from Aaron Griswold. And it starts uh, this, the privilege against self-incrimination is one of the great landmarks of man's struggle to make himself civilized. The fifth is a lone sure rock in time of storm, a symbol of the ultimate moral sense of the community upholding the best in us. <clears throat> so what is the Fifth Amendment? Because this is really going to be central to our discussion here, like the Fourth Amendment was central to all our discussions about searches. Well, in part, the important part of the Fifth Amendment reads, Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall they be or no shall be compelled in any criminal case, notice it says criminal case there, uh, to be a witness against himself, nor to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor any private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So there's a couple things wrapped up in there, some of which touch us directly, some of us not so much. For example, the ending, uh, the compensation clause, uh, not as critical. The due process clause is going to take some real analysis, um, and, but we're going to focus in this chapter really on that kind of um, middle part, uh, being compelled to be a witness against himself. Essentially, we're going to examine um, the right not to um, tell the police, the state, what you know in a criminal case if that information is going to lead to your conviction. Uh, and this is a uh, right enshrined in the Constitution, obviously, and it's very central to what we're going to talk about. So that is, after all, self-incrimination is what we're going to talk about. It. So most of the time when we're talking about self-incrimination, we're talking about the role of confessions. Now, some societies rely upon confessions to solve most crimes. If you go to certain Asian societies, uh, Japan is somewhat notorious for this. If you look at the number of confessions, um, it's, it's astronomically high. Um, and then you can look at, uh, and now Japan is not like this, but if you look at certain countries where um, confessions are elicited from people via um, torture or physical intimidation, um, and that solves the crime. Uh, and if we go into our own past, uh, the, the Greco-Roman civilizations practiced um, extraction of information <coughs> via torture. So self-incrimination has a um, close link to the idea of confession. So morally, of course, the confession of a sin is seen as a positive step forward. If we go back theologically, and we look at confession. Uh, confession, for example, is one of the fundamental tenets of the Catholic religion and some associated Christian sects, where one confesses what one does, one makes contrition, uh, one offers a solution to what you did or asks for atonement of the sin. Criminally, uh, confessions often result in greater not lesser penalties, uh, although sometimes we play a degree of lip service to the idea that um, you'll be treated more leniently if you confess. It's typically not the case, to be honest. Um, so it's, it's a bit ambivalent, the role confession plays. First of all, um, it is evidence of guilt and remorse, um, and, but it, and it provides us with access to at least what the defendant is saying, their beliefs, their knowledge, their thinking. After all, often we are concerned what motivated someone to do something, um, and the only way you can prove motive, uh, in, in some ways, not the only way, I guess that's an incorrect statement, 
uh, one of the ways you prove motive is you ask people why they did it. All right, so the nature of confessions, um, we're going to look at some different settings for when confessions occur. Um, now, there can be people, first of all, who simply confess to friends or associates, which we might have access to. So that might be, you know, we're taping someone's conversation and they admit they committed a crime. Or, um, as I said before, you might have confessions to a religious figure. A confession uh, is another rite of many churches. So one of the things is uh, if you are a practicing Catholic, you will go into uh, a confessional and you will acknowledge your sins, some of which could be crimes. Uh, we can have confessions during plea bargaining um, very often, and this is a very common setting that we see it, at least in the law, moving more concretely towards the law here. We're very interested in getting the individual to admit he did it. It removes a lot of the doubt in the society. It's often a component of a plea bargain where we say, okay, you're going to plead to this case and you have to confess that you did it in open court. So we're going to remove all doubt by saying, this is your plea bargain. <clears throat> Part of that plea bargain is contingent upon you saying you did it. You can also make confessions during sentencing when you make um, incriminating statements to show your remorse. So you didn't confess, maybe you didn't take the stand at your trial. Now, if it's, for example, a, a capital offense, if it's a bifurcated trial, we're in capital trials in the United States, we have two phases. We have the phase where you are convicted or acquitted. If you are convicted, we go to the second stage where you are sentenced to death or usually life imprisonment. It's during this stage sometimes that an individual who perhaps didn't take the stand uh, uh, confesses to the crime, tries to show remorse. Of course, one of the ones that's most important for us is when the police interrogate someone. Um, very often people interrogated by the police confess that they committed crimes. Um, this, of course, you know, raises a lot of questions, some of which we're going to be looking at in this chapter. Okay, um, the self-incrimination setting. Most of you, fortunately for you, have never been arrested. And you should be aware that being taken to a police station is an unpleasant experience and it's intentionally not designed to be that way. We're not trying to make people comfortable. In fact, you're going to feel a degree of psychological pressure when you're taught into, when you're brought into custody. And this is intentional. Um, the atmosphere uh, and the actions are supposed to flush out the truth and we want people to feel that when they're down at the police station, the thing they need to do is confess. Um, you have to remember, of course, that this is a certain stage. You are at the stage that you were actually brought down. We've, we've moved from what was previously the investigatory stage, we're trying to figure out who did it, to the accusatory stage. We think John Smith did it, or whoever the name of the individual is, and now we're accusing him of it, and very often we want to develop more information. So the accusatory stage is an important stage. Um, at this stage, we have to balance the needs of law enforcement, so the needs to prove that they did it, make sure they don't have the wrong guy, make sure they got the right guy, maybe recover uh, goods that were stolen, maybe help people that were injured, versus an individual's right of privacy and liberty. So we're going to balance these two things. Because after all, don't forget, no human institution is perfect. And some of the time, you're going to arrest people, you're going to move from the inquisitory to the accusatory stage, and you're going to have the wrong person. So there is a necessity to um, balance criminal investigation, make sure we got the right person, versus your right to be free. Because sometimes the police make mistakes. Sometimes they have people that didn't do it, or committed different crimes or didn't commit the crime in the way we thought they did. So it is important because first of all many crimes would go unsolved without information gained during interrogations. Um, now, unless caught in an act or interrogated in private, criminals often simply don't confess. So um, 
very often there is a degree of coercion, psychological coercion, built into this contact with the police. Um, the, uh, the, the opening, well, there, there's a quote at the beginning uh, of the chapter from um, Justice uh, Rehnquist uh, where he talks about, um, and Justice Wright, um, basically talking about how it's, it's really important to have an overview of what's going on with confessions, to, to know what's going on, because we should be careful that um, we don't romanticize either the police or the criminal. I mean, if you look at American popular culture, um, there are movies that glorify, movies and TV shows that glorify the police, um, and present an unrealistic portrayal of what they are. And then there's also um, movies and TV shows that glorify criminals and present unrealistic portrayals of what they are. So we have to realize that we're dealing with our perceptions as we go in here. Um, but there are three parts of the Constitution that kind of forms the lens that, that we look at this interaction between the suspect and the police. So those three parts of the Constitution, first of all, and I, I said we we're going to uh, mention due process earlier, is the 14th Amendment's due process clause, which is in conjunction with the 5th Amendment's due process clause. So the, the, one of the things we're going to look at is due process. The 6th Amendment's right to counsel, uh, and that jumps ahead a little bit, but also, and critically for us, the 5th Amendment self-incrimination clause. So, you know, that the, the, the 14th Amendment says you cannot be, no state, it says, shall deprive any individual or any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. The 6th Amendment says, in all criminal prosecutions, notice not civil, the accused shall have the assistance of counsel for his defense. That, that's kind of, I, I let out, I omitted some of the things in the middle there. And then we got the 5th Amendment that we've already talked about. So the U.S. Constitution impacts the process, this interrogational process, at different stages. First of all, of course, due process is, is there at all the time. The Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment due process is from the investigatory to the accusatory to the custodial phase. You can't, for example, investigate someone by torturing them, accuse them of the crime, and then sentence them because all three of those stages would violate due process. Now the right to counsel doesn't really start until we've moved to the accusatory phase. You have no right to counsel when the police are doing an investigation. You can get counsel, and as a private attorney, I would recommend anybody being investigated by the police to retain counsel before the police move to the interrogation phase, just to be made aware of all these things. The Fifth Amendment self-incrimination clause doesn't exist at that first phase, that inquisitory phase, but does exist by the time we go to accusatory, which is your interrogation and all the stages thereafter. Okay, um, approach, approaches to interrogation and confession. As I said, you've got these three different parts, the, the due process, the right of counsel, and your right against self-incrimination. So let's look a bit, little bit about due process. I've been throwing those words around and perhaps it's it's time to focus in on them. Due process, essentially there's two due processes here uh, and if you've taken our constitutional law course here at Wake Tech there's procedural due process and there's substantive due process. So procedural due process, and this is a gross simplification, says is the way in which the, and we're, we're, if we're focusing on confessions here, is the way in which the confession was gathered fair and just. And substantive due process is, really looks at overall fairness. So most early false confession cases as we look at them that violate due process were white mobs who rounded up poor, often illiterate blacks and tortured them till they confess. And it, it and those came, became Supreme Court cases and later cases. So the basic idea behind the due process approach is that this confession that was given by someone that was tortured, you, you can look at some of these cases, there's one case I remember very well, and 
um, if you take constitutional law we'll focus on these more often but um, where literally a uh, mob put a rope around the neck of um, a black man who was arrested <clears throat> lifted him off the ground put him back down said you need to confess he wouldn't confess they lifted him up uh, by his neck again until he confessed so that would be a violation of due process clearly we would say that you know this is not a voluntary confession so the rationale for for due process there's different rationale there's a reliability rationale and I think this is really important if I let, let's use that that case I briefly alluded to and think about this first of all is it reliable if I'm threatening you with death you'll confess to anything if I say if you don't tell me you killed Elvis Presley and I'm going to mock lynch you until you confess that you did eventually you're going to confess you that you did it and the, the problem with that is it's simply not reliable now even if it's true let's suppose we have a suspect we get you know the, the, we, we have a suspect that we pretty sure he committed a crime we torture him uh, we force a confession from him um, that's okay and it turns out he, he gives us concrete evidence that he actually committed the crime so we torture someone uh, we waterboard them or we do something and they, they give us information that they robbed the bank or they killed someone and they tell us where the money is and they, or they tell us where the murder weapon is and we test and sure enough it is well the, the problem with this is even if they're true even if that is inf you violated um, due process that substantive due process um, we also have to under the last rationale and this is an overarching rationale involuntary confessions are inherently unreliable and contrary to our system of justice they are not a product of rational intellect and free will and you know we prize the ability to exercise our free will in our society okay so that's the due process we'll set that aside for a moment we'll move on to the right to counsel approach um, in 1954 uh, four of the nine justices were calling for were, were basically saying by the time that the police have moved from investigatory to accusatory and they brought you in for a custodial interrogation this is a critical stage and you should have the right to counsel now previous to this you didn't your, your right to counsel might attach very late in the game might have been after arrested after interrogation when you went to trial now we, we, this is not a constitutional law class but what you should be aware of is the right to counsel at first as it was interpreted really meant that you simply had a right um, if you could afford an attorney to have one it's only as time goes on that this um, is kind of broadly interpreted that if you can't afford one and this is er very early for death penalty cases and slower later the, the premier case here is Gideon versus Wainwright it's only later that you get the right to counsel in almost any stage so in Escobedo versus Illinois the court held that as soon as you've moved to investigatory as soon I mean excuse, excuse me as soon as we've moved from the investigation to the accusation then you have a right to counsel you do not have a right to a lawyer until the time of trial and they confess before trial if if that's the standard you're going to take then it's no more than, than a trial is no more than appeal from an interrogation most people are unaware of their rights at least in 1964 that's what the court felt and the Supreme Court of the United States it looked at a number of cases that 1958 number is really from a case called Cooker excuse me Crocker versus California um, and it's it's an interesting case uh, it kind of touches a little bit uh, to you have a law student who was working as a houseboy for a woman that he was having an affair with it's pretty interesting she broke it off um, Crooker confessed to stabbing and strangling her now they wouldn't let him call his um, lawyer but and there was no physical evidence that he had been forced to confess 
He was allowed to eat, drink, smoke. Um, the, the interrogation only lasted an hour. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld his interrogation in 1958. But you could see in four of the justices that that standard was changing. So that by the time Escobedo comes along, six years later, the court's composition is different. And I, I'd like to emphasize here that it's very, very important who's on the court. Um, it really shapes what law and rights exist. Okay, so um, basically in, in Escobedo they said if you don't have a right to a lawyer until the trial and you confess before the trial, then the trial is no more than an appeal from an interrogation. If we're going to solve all the cases by interrogating people before trial, well, what's the most important phase? So what the really the, the court recognized kind of the practicality that it had been ignoring, that it's so important when people are interrogated that they are their rights are protected, and the best way to do that is going to have be an attorney. So the self-incrimination approach, two years after this, we have arguably the most famous case. This is a case that almost everybody I teach has at least heard the name, the Miranda case. And, and if you've lived in the United States any time in the last half century, you have heard the Miranda warning. It's on TV. It's, on, it's in movies. It's on uh, podcasts. It's everywhere. <coughs> you've heard someone get Mirandized. You have the right to remain silent. You give up the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and use to be against you in a court of law. <clears throat> you have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, we'll appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? Now, that's the shorthand version of it. And there's no absolute specific um, way you have to say that, but you still have to convey those points. So two years after Escobedo, where the, the court started to recognize that this is very important, when you're in the accusatory stage, you have Miranda versus Arizona. It is an extremely important case. Um, the the you had an individual claiming um, a violation of his Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, again, reviewing the Fifth Amendment here, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against themselves. So that kind of teases up for the this this case that everybody's heard of, Miranda versus Arizona. Now the first thing to keep in mind about this is that Miranda is a difficult case. Uh, what you're going to find is Mr. Miranda is, at least at first appearance, a fairly unsympathetic person. Uh, Mr. Miranda is arrested in 1963 uh, for kidnapping and rape and he is interrogated for two hours um, and then at some point he signs a confession to the crime um, now the defense attorney objected the officers testified um, that he had confessed he got a sentence of uh, I think it's 20 to 30 years on, on each count and they were to run concurrently so he's, he's going to be in there a while the majority said that Without proper safeguards, a custodial interrogation is inherently compelling. So it's an inherent violation. This is a bright line case. The interrogation is inherently coercive. Suspects must be made aware of their rights before interrogation. I want to emphasize that point because I would have clients sometimes that would call me and say, if I was appointed to, to represent them, I'm not going to be convicted because they never read me Miranda. And my, my question always was, well, did they question you? No, I've just been arrested, but I never Mirandized. Well, they don't have to Mirandize you. The, the bright line doesn't start until you're arrested and the interrogation starts. Now, there was this, this opinion was um, written by Warren. There was a dissent. Uh, Clark wrote a dissent, White wrote a dissent, um, Harlan and Stewart both wrote dissents. They said, look, confessions is a very valuable tool. And once you start telling people about their rights, we're going to have fewer confessions, and that's going to lead to more crime. Not a lot of evidence to support that, but that's sure where they went. Okay, so what is the bright line rule here? During custodial interrogations, here's the bright line. Here's the 
four famous warnings you get. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to be told that anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to a lawyer. You have a right to be told if you can afford the lawyer, one will be appointed. Now stick a pin in that because one of the interesting things that's happened in the last 20, 30 years in the United States is, let's suppose you're poor, they appoint an attorney for you, turns out the police have no case, you're acquitted of the crime. In some states, you're going to get a bill. You may say, well, I thought you, you gave me a court appointed attorney. We did, but you got to pay for it. Um, five additional bright line rules. These are not in Miranda itself, but in the application of Miranda that happened. First of all, if a suspect says he doesn't want to talk anymore, that ends the interrogation. If a suspect says, I'm, I'm done, I don't want you to question me anymore. The second, and this is really a, a much brighter of a bright line, if he says, I want an attorney, that's it. Um, you, you don't keep questioning once they say, I want my attorney, I want an attorney. Any statement you make without a lawyer places a heavy burden on the government to prove you raised, waived your rights. So if you're interrogating someone, there's no lawyer present during the interrogation, you better show some sort of waiver. And usually we like signed waivers. Statements obtained in violation of these rules are not admitted into evidence. Now, there's a little asterisk that your book should have put there. Against the party whose constitutional rights were violated. You still may be able to use the evidence, simply can't use it against the person whose rights were violated. You also can't punish people for asserting their rights to remain silent. If you say, well, if, if you don't tell me what you know, I'm going to charge you with more crimes, or I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I'm going to make it more difficult for you, I'm going to put you in a, you know, a batter jail cell or something like that, you can't do that either. All right, testimony. The government can't force defendants to give testimony against themselves. This means witness against oneself. Now, that witness testimony has been limited to what you say or what you write. And even then, there is a little bit of wiggle room there. The Fifth Amendment, for example, protects no physical evidence. If you're in custody, they can take your blood, they can take a hair sample, they can take DNA, they can take a voice sample. So remember when it says testimony is what you say or write? Suppose there's a ransom note that was written. You know, someone gets kidnapped, and the person we think did it wrote and said, yes, um, you know, we th this, this person committed the crime, or, or the, I, I want this amount of money. You could make them write a sample of their writing. It would be admissible to compare against the ransom note it would not be admissible to its content. Uh, I know that's a little unclear. Okay, compulsion. Um, how do we measure compulsion? I mean, yes, you know, obviously if you, um, you know, take a hammer and hit someone in the head, sure, you're, you're physically compelling them. Um, but at what point do we look at the totality of the circumstance? I mean, at what point do we say we've gone beyond it? So what we're really looking for, and this is the due process, is that we're looking that the, the statement is voluntary and that you know you made the statement. And we want to judge whether this was improper by looking at a totality of all the circumstances surrounding this interrogation. Um, so, you know, if you conducted this on the ledge of the building, holding him by his collar where he's leaning backwards, no, you didn't beat him with a hammer, but still the implied threat there is, I'm going to drop you if you don't confess. So, when does Miranda apply? Going back to that previous point, it doesn't say you have to warn people when you arrest them. You can question people even without a, a Mirandizing them. First of all, you show up at a crime scene, you don't know who did it. You might have a suspicion someone did it, but you, you can ask people questions. Hey, did you see what happened? Hey, did you stab that guy? Questioning people at the crime scene does not require Miranda. Questioning people before they're suspects. Questioning people during Fourth Amendment stops, and this is Terry stops, none of these require Mirandize. Remembering one thing, though, 
by and large, and there are a few exceptions to this as well, because there's exceptions in every area of the law, if you show up at the scene of the crime and someone says, I want you to tell me what happened, and the guy says, no, um, you don't have to answer all the questions of the police. Um, now, they can get a subpoena requiring you. Um, there can be circumstances where you're brought into custody, but you don't have to cooperate. All right, so brings up also the issue of what's custody. The Supreme Court of the United States defined this, and we're going to get to a, a case in a moment. We'll get to the uh, Berkmer versus um, the sheriff of Franklin County versus McCartney in a minute. But um, in Miranda, the Supreme Court defined custody as being held by the police. <clears throat> so it's, first of all, got to be a, being held by a government agency in a police station or depriving the individual of freedom of action in a significant way. They're back at the squad car, that can be interrogation. The court is sending a message there that Miranda targets coercion regardless of where it happens. So let's look at one of these cases. And this is uh, Berkemer versus uh, McCarty, uh, which I believe is the next one. Yeah, it is. Okay, so McCarty's driving erratically. Um, this is, uh, I think, it happened, I think it's a highway patrol, if I'm not mistaken. Um, sees um, McCarty driving, you know, late in the evening, I think it was March or so, and he follows the car for two miles, um, stops him, asks him to get out of the vehicle. McCartney gets out. Um, he's having problems standing. He concludes he's drunk and could not leave. William then just asks, well, what were you doing? And he hasn't Mirandized him. And here's the question is, you know, Williams, the officer, says, this guy's drunk. I'm not going to let him leave. I'm pretty sure. Um, Williams questions McCarty and hasn't Mirandized him. So you say, well, is he in custody? And, and you know, the court says no. Okay. So... You know, McCartney had said, yeah, well, I had two beers and a couple joints a short time before. Now, you know, there's a general rule that if someone tells you they have two beers, you can multiply that between two and three times. So this guy had a six pack. And if he said he smoked a couple joints, he, he, he blew out the pipe. So the majority said this was not Miranda. And this is a Marshall case. Um, the majority said it's only triggered with the formal arrest. There was no need for Miranda here. Um, custodial circumstances can be established looking at, you know, a totality of circumstances. First of all, do they have probable cause to arrest? Suppose this guy comes up and he's erratic on his feet. And I think he's drunk driving. And at that point, I might have formed the conclusion that he's a drunk driver. Um, but when I question him, I say, what's up? And, and he starts to slur his words and he says, I'm a diabetic. Um, I was starting to have an insulin reaction. Well, you know, you may not arrest him at that point. You might give him some sugar if he sobers up, put him on his way. Now, you know, one of the questions for custodial interrogation is, do you have probable cause to arrest? Do you intend to detain them? Does the person believe that their freedom's restricted? Have you focused, you moved from an investigatory to an accusatory situation? What language are you using? What's the physical surrounding? How much evidence do you have? How long were you detained? How much pressure is being used? So I can't say that one of these factors is automatic, but you have to look at all the circumstances. That's why we always say totality of the circumstances. So a custodial uh, interrogation. Um, the Montana Department of Fish and Wildlife received a search warrant to search David Roberts' home for evidence of illegal hunting. Uh, you know, this is the States versus Roberts case. Um, we're not in the Quarles case, which is the next big one, but um, while they were searching, he called his girlfriend from work, was informed that the search was going on, and asked if he could come to the uh, FWP to answer some questions. He went there. He was given Miranda. He answered some questions. He was given Miranda a second time by ATF. After questions, he left, but later was arrested. The statements he made were then admitted. There was a move to suppress. 
but it was denied. The Montana Appellate Court said this wasn't custodial. The statements were allowed to stand. Now there can, of course, be non-custodial circumstances. Uh, we're, we're almost to the Quarles case, so hold on. But these detentions don't qualify as being in custody. Routine traffic stop, not custodial. Requiring probationers to attend routine meetings, not probational. Detaining persons during the execution of a search warrant, not. So all three of those are examples where the courts have ruled uh, not custodial. Now we're going to get to Quarles case, which is a pretty important case here. This is came down in 1984. Uh, this is uh, New York versus Quarles. Um, Benjamin Quarles, uh, this is a New York case, was charged with criminal possession of a weapon. Um, he was arrested on suspicion of rape. Uh, an empty shoulder holster was found. After arrest, but before he was Mirandized, the police said, where's the gun? And he said, it's over there. Um, and they go over and get the gun. So the, the you know, the, the police argument here is we did this because you do not want to leave since we believe this guy had a gun um, that, you know, we're going to leave a gun out in public. And this actually happened. I don't think there are A&P supermarkets anymore, but it happened in a supermarket up in New York. And the, the court said, look, public safety here is more important. If the police believe that there's a gun floating around, then it's more important to find the gun than protect the constitutional rights. Um, if the suspect may endanger the officer or somebody nearby, the, the officer may ask questions before they Mirandize and use that. So how useful is this? This is great. Um, public safety exceptions are almost uniformly working. They, they do well. Um, if general and public law enforcement are both in danger, then there's a 95% uh, success race, ratio. It's been applied to guns, it's been applied to bombs, even free tried bubonic plague or hepatitis, um, and from bites made during arrest. So, I mean, there is really broad exception of the public safety. Okay. Um, so I, I recommend you take a look at Quarles. It's a it's a fairly long case in our text, um, and there is a dissent. The dissent is written by Marshall, and uh, I think Brennan's and Stevens joined the Marshall case. Um, okay, let's move on and talk about um, the meaning of interrogations, constitutional significance of the words interrogation confession. The Fifth Amendment guarantees you the right against compelling an individual to be a witness against themselves. The Sixth Amendment is your right to counsel. The Fifth and the Fourteenth are your due process again. So we're, I'm, I'm running these by you again because we're going to go to the Fifth Amendment test in a second, which is where we are right now. The Fifth Amendment functional equivalent of, test, of question test says, Miranda safeguards come into play whenever a person in custody is subject to either express questioning or its functional equivalent. So what's the alternative? Now, there's going to be some exceptions to this, but let's look at the, the next one, the Sixth Amendment. Remember, the Sixth Amendment deliberately eliciting response test provides broader protection for interrogation and more restrictions. As soon as the government starts its formal proceedings, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel kicks in. So once the Sixth Amendment is triggered, there's less of it. And then we've got the due process test, which is a more general because the term's less defined. Due process cannot be specifically defined because it changes depending what each society thinks justice is. The guarantee to protect the life, liberty, and property without due process, which can be procedural, or as I said, it could be substantive. All right, the Fourth and Fifteenth Amendment. The due process test, um, like I said, we're going to move on to the, the waiver. Because what can happen is you get someone, let's suppose we've decided, yes, it's a custodial situation. We've moved from accusatory, excuse me, we've moved from investigatory to accusatory. We brought them into um, custody. Now we want to question them, and they say, yeah, I'll answer your questions. Now, I'll be honest, as a defense attorney, uh, my advice to clients always, 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 if an attorney's not in the room, 
shut the hell up. Don't answer questions. And if I am uh, teaching at the Rod Police Academy or uh, teaching officers, my advice is always get them talking. Um, so, you know, there's, there's two strands here. The, th the amazing thing is m a lot of suspects waive their rights and talk to interrogators without lawyers being there. And there's, there's a couple questions here. Uh, was it valid and was it voluntary? So, you know, was, did they understand what was going on? Was it voluntary that they gave up their rights? These are, th these are questions that haunt interrogations. So even when we make a waiver, we got to be a little careful. The, 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 the court has made it clear that even after waiver, silence can easily be waived again. So let's, let's look at a case here because we're, we're drifting into the theoretical and it's always good to reground ourselves by looking at a real case. And this case is, uh, you're gonna, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation except for Tompkins, but it's Bergenhus versus Tompkins. Okay, so Tompkins was informed of his rights, um, but he wouldn't sign a waiver of his rights. So here's your waiver so that we can keep questioning. I won't sign it, but I'm going to keep talking. So the question is, is this a waiver? You know, it's, it's a kind of a weird situation you wouldn't think about. Um, and this was all about a shooting at a mall in Michigan, if you, if you read the case. And the interrogation had begun at um, I think 1 o'clock or 1.30 in the afternoon. And it went on for hour after hour. It went up for three hours. Um, he was silent. Um, after three hours of interrogation and um, it was conducted in a small room and you know the dissent here doesn't agree the majority says once he started speaking after this it's a waiver even if he didn't expressly give it the dissent said three hours of silence followed by replies is not waiver um, so the, the majority opinion and the majority opinion is written by Kennedy uh, and I think Robert Scalia, Thomas, and Alito joined it. The dissenting opinion of Sotomayor and Stevens, Ginsburg, and Breyer, uh, they said, no, you know, look, if, if someone signs for three hours, that really should be evidence that they're not waiving it. But what the majority said, well, no, it's, it's, it's okay. This is a 2010 case. This is a late case. So we have the express and implied waiver test. The express waiver test, the suspect makes it clear, as, I know what I got, I'm giving them up, I know the consequences. That's great. That's the best thing you can have as a cop. Because here you go, you got a piece of paper very often or you've got an express statement. Implied, if we look at the totality of the circumstances, remember totality of circumstances can be used to establish are you in custody? Totality of circumstances can be used to establish that you waived it. The total circumstances surrounding each case tell you um, you know what's going on and you knew your rights and you gave them up but you didn't do it expressly. You didn't sign something. So one of the things is you have to knowingly and intelligently waive your rights. And you know, you could have a real question as to whether this is that ever happens. <laughs> Waivers have to be voluntary and knowingly. So here are some of the things we are concerned about. Do you understand English? Are you familiar with the criminal justice system? And here's a big one, intelligence. At what point do you not appreciate what it means to waive your rights. At what point do we say someone with an IQ of 100, that's the average IQ of an American today, that's fine, they can waive their rights. What about someone 90? What about someone 80, 70, 60? And, and IQ is a poor overall measurement, but it's a tool we can use. At what point do you say your intelligence is so low that you can't knowingly waive it? What's your physical condition? What's your education? Do you have a lawyer there? I mean, are you a lawyer being interrogated? What's your mental condition? Uh, you know, that could include, are you high? Are you drunk? I mean, you, we say sometimes if we look at consent, you know, you can't consent to certain things when you're drunk. Certain contracts can't be signed when you're intoxicated. Should that apply for um, interrogations? How old are you? Okay, can a 10-year-old waive their rights? Can an 11? Can a 12? And again, we're going to have to look at all the circumstances here. All right, so we're going to move on to whether it's involuntary self-incrimination or voluntary. So 
involuntary. If officers engaged in coercive conduct uh, and that caused you to make the statements, we've triggered the rule. So again, we're going to have to look at all the common circumstances that can give rise to when we apply our totality of circumstances test. Here are some of them. Where did it take place? Is it downtown? Is it in your home? Two different things. Are you in an 8 by 10 room? Like we're talking about, you know, in the uh, the um, uh, the uh, Bergen Isles uh, versus Tompkins case? Or are you in your house? Did you initiate the contact with the law enforcement officer? Did you go in, like the Montana Fish and Game case? Did you go in and talk to them? <clears throat> Did you get your Miranda? How many people were questioning you? Is it one person, two, ten? How long did the questioning go on? An hour, two hours, ten hours? Were you given access to food, water, and toilet? Did the police use any threats, any promises, any lies, or tricks? Remember, the, the police are usually free to lie to you about a lot of stuff, not everything. Were you denied access to a lawyer? And then we can look at the ones we just, you know, we outlined before. The suspect's age, their gender, their race, their physical and mental condition, their education. Do they have a drug problem? Do they have experience with the criminal justice system? So some common circumstances that we consider. Courts have looked at, at the following things that can cause concern about what's going on. But they've said these don't necessarily mean that we're going to throw it out. Um, promises of leniency. Um, now, if you expressly promise them not to charge, that can be a different story. Promises of better treatment. Confronting the accused with evidence of guilt. Appealing to people's emotions. Or lying to them. All of these have been okayed. None of them have been ruled to be inappropriate. You know, the, the big one there that is usually the shock to most of my students is, can the police lie to you? And the, and the answer is, sure they can. They can say, we've got a witness that show, saw you at the scene of the crime. And then they could say, if you confess now, it's likely to go easier for you. Now, they didn't promise you it's going to go easier for you. It's likely to. That's going to be enough. So let's look at a case. And, and this is a difficult case. And, and I, you know, this is something I was thinking about last night when I was prepping for this lecture, is the cases you read always, you know, there's always two sides to it. You don't read the cases that are slam, you know, obvious, yeah, this is the way to rule, because those cases don't get appealed. The cases you read is where there's two sides to the question. So let's look at Colorado versus Connolly. Um, and th this case had its start back in 83, but Connolly was a chronic schizophrenic. And he comes up to um, some police officers. Uh, initially, I think it was just Officer, uh, I think it was Anderson was his name, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he said, I murdered somebody. And Anderson immediately said, here's your Miranda, you got the right to remain silent, gave him the nine yards. Connolly said, I understand that, but I still want to talk. So he says, well, have you been drinking? No, 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 haven't been drinking. Um, but I have been a patient in the mental hospital sometimes. And uh, Anderson said, look, you're under no obligations to talk to me. But Connie said, I want to talk to you because it's bothering my conscience. So at this point, a homicide detective shows up. And uh, we get more details. Okay, And at trial, the question arises, well, you know, actually there was a preliminary hearing because most evidence, evidentiary suppression happens then. You're going to file a motion to keep it out so it doesn't go to trial. But at trial, some of this confession and evidence gets in. And the question is, uh, can it be voluntary if someone has this level of mental illness? Does the voluntary nature of confession mean that someone has to be mentally sane? And, and what the, the courts did and again, this is a Rehnquist decision, is they said it's going to be left up to the state's evidentiary law, not the Constitution. They didn't apply the Constitution here. They said it's up to the state to frame the rules of evidence, what's trustworthy, what's not, to decide if it can get in. Now, the dissent here, which was Brennan and Marshall, uh, unsurprisingly, they're in, they're in the dissent a lot, 
excuse me, um, is that those people who are seriously mentally ill cannot voluntarily confess. They, they really don't have that voluntary part of it. But the, the court refused to intervene there. Okay, so research has proven that false confessions fall into three large blocks. Voluntary false confessions, people seek fame or self-punishment, or they confuse reality with fantasy, or they do it to help a criminal. So, again, sometimes people will confess to crimes they didn't commit. Then there's compliant false confessions. Um, they're pressured during interrogations, and they often think that the short-term benefit is better than the long-term sentence. Very often, they're, they don't understand how serious it is to confess. The third one is they're innocent, but believe it or not, they come to believe they did it. And some of this might be, again, mental illness. So the empirical evidence, as we start to look at 125 cases of false confession that were studied, we know them to be false. Why? Well, one, maybe the crime didn't actually happen. Two, maybe the defendant, if it even happened, could not have possibly did it in another state or physically incapable. Three, another person was shown to have been the person that really did it. And, or the fourth one, DNA exonerated. Now, here's the innocent, th here's the interesting thing. Of these 125 false confession cases that went to trial, 81% who are innocent were still convicted. Once you have a false confession, the jury's just going to believe it. 80% were interrogated for more than six hours. 100% had actually been jailed or imprisoned. And here's, I think, among the most interesting. 44, so right around 30 plus percent of them, were juveniles. 28% uh, 28, excuse me, about 20% were mentally challenged and 12%, right around 10% of the whole case, 12 numbers, excuse me, these are not percentage, 12 of them were mentally ill. So mental illness, mental issues, or age are the big things that lead empirically to false confessions. So what reforms have been suggested? Um, well, uh, among those considered, reducing the length of time people are in custody, eliminating the use of false information, limiting how the police can lie. And here's a big one, and this is very contentious because this was being done much more for a while, but it was stopped by some police departments because they were losing cases. Record all the interrogations and confessions. Don't rely upon the words of the officers or the words of the suspect, whether it was voluntary, threat, or whatever record the whole thing. Don't record just when they confess, record the interrogation. Taken together perhaps these might reduce some of the issues. Um, again, there's uh, th there's a lot of uh, drawbacks to this. It can be expensive, it interferes, okay? Uh, suspects are less likely to talk and obviously police don't like that. All right, well that really concludes what we want to do. We're right at our 40 minutes, 50 minutes to an hour, where I want it to be. Um, and that's really going to be our chapter eight. Whenever you're ready, you can pick up with chapter nine. Have a good afternoon, evening, or morning.